I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer at Gold Derby, and I am joined today by Academy Award nominee Joy McMillan, the co-editor of Barry Jenkins' 10-episode limited series, The Underground Railroad. Joy, this is obvious. This obviously isn't the first time uh, you've worked with Barry. You went to him. You went to college with him, and of course, co-edited both of his features with Nat Sanders. Uh, Moonlight, uh, for which you made history with your Oscar nomination, and If Beale Street Could Talk. So, how was it diving with Barry into this multi-episode television effort, which I have to assume must have felt like shooting multiple feature films, right? <laughs> it definitely that is a, a great way to put it it definitely felt like you know shooting uh multiple films and one of the things that was interesting for us is that on this endeavor um you know i nat went and shot um shang chi so he's working with dustin creighton on a marvel film so this was my first time you know as a head of a department and it was one of those things navigating those waters of you know to help like to be resourceful, but not overbearing. You know, that was kind of my, that was my mantra. You know, I wanted everyone to feel comfortable to come to my editing room, to ask questions, you know, seek out guidance, but I never ever wanted to be, you know, a uh, overlord, <laughs> so to speak. Um, and so jumping into the series with Barry, you know, and James Laxon, our cinematographer, um, Carolyn Eslin, our costume designer, Mark Freeberg, our production designer, we all had worked on Beale Street together. And so we kind of had the shorthand where we understood what we needed to bring to the table in order to accomplish this, you know, epic <laughs> series, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, looking at it at a whole felt overwhelming, but just taking it scene by scene, you know, episode by episode was kind of how we slowly but surely chipped away at the series. And then, um, you know, I think our final product is something to really be proud of. Absolutely. And so you edited five episodes uh, of the show, including the first and the last episode, which I read were the first two that you actually worked on. But starting with the first, uh, it's titled Georgia and opens with this montage that uh, uniquely strings together very specific scenes and images that we actually get to see throughout the season and, and then ends on this close up uh, of Cora's face. How did you, Barry, and your other colleagues come up with this uh, unique opening montage and why did you decide to open the show with specifically that? Yeah, you know, in the script, it, you know, that first chapter, Georgia, it's, you know, it talks about opening with Cora falling into a void. And that was one of the things where I was just like, how are we going to shoot that? You know, <laughs> we might Beale Street, we're, we're gigantic budgets. And, you know, immediately I'm like, we're starting off with visual effects. And that was one of the things that we definitely tackled in the series of, was doing um, visual effects, but also making them feel grounded in some sort of reality. Um, and I think we were very successful with incorporating, you know, magical realism, but also, you know, telling a story of this woman, Cora, and her journey to freedom. And, um, you know, the opening was one of the things that we spent, Barry and I spent a lot of time with. Um, early on, we kind of locked in the shots that we wanted of that first shot of Cora's face. Um, all of that took place over blue screen. So it was, you know, we really paid attention to what, you know, Cora was, or Tusa was giving us um, as she was playing that role, Cora, and making sure that what we saw in her eyes were going to immediately connect the audience to her story. And the shots that we actually, you know, started to include to give like, kind of like breadcrumbs or hints to where Cora might be going, but not totally and completely give away her story or things that we kind of came back to as we worked on the rest of the episodes. And so that's how we kind of accomplished those shots that you see early on that kind of give you a little, a little sneak peek into what the series is gonna unfold. And it's certainly such a unique way uh, to start uh, the show. And in that regard, how important or meaningful was it to you the editor of half of this series uh, to be able to set the tone and to be able to be the one to introduce Cora and her journey to us viewers. You know, it's one of those things I, I did a lovely panel um, for women in the film and it was kind of amazing to see this array of women who are all kind of working in the limited series space and um, seeing our hands, you know, get involved in these like amazing series like Mayor of Easttown, WandaVision. Yeah. 
And um, it was one of those things where I was like, you know, we're telling these stories from um, these now unique point of view that are presenting these very strong women who are allowed to be fully formed and who are allowed to have layers. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, um, people are interested in people with flaws, you know? No, and I think because I, I think you can find a connection where you're not giving us these perfect people who have these perfect lives, and that was one of the things that we really wanted to focus on. When you first meet Cora, she's guarded, um, and but she's also very intriguing. And so you know, having that, having the weight of doing that first episode, I was talking to them and I was like, man, working on a series is hard. It's tricky, and that first episode has to hook the audience and keep them wanting more, but also tell a complete story. So that was one of the things that, even though I started on, um, you know, chapter one first, it was one of the last episodes that we actually finished. Oh wow! Um, because yeah, due to the fact that we kept going back to it because we're like, as we figured out the series and as we really, really honed in on what that, you know, that final chapter was going to be, we wanted to make sure that the path that we, you know, laid out made sense to where we ended up. And so that was, you know, I know Amazon was like, are you going to give us chapter one yet? <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely uh, fascinating. I was going to ask next if it was strange to work on the last episode or to start working on it so early on, or did it really facilitate working on episodes five, six, and nine, which were the other three installments uh, that you did outside of the first and the last? Uh, did that help yeah. the process in some way? It definitely helped because I think the moment that we figured out what Mabel's journey is and how we were going to tell her story, it made us realize this, not only the significance of Mabel's journey, but the significance of Mabel on Cora's journey. Mm -hmm. You know, like her feeling abandoned by her mother and her not knowing what happened to her mother plays so much in how her whole psyche and her mannerisms and how guarded she is about letting other people into her life. And so you know, figuring out Mabel, it then we kind of went and was like, how can we weave Mabel throughout the rest of these episodes? And that's how we came up with using the flashbacks and making sure that people not only know who Mabel is, but realize how much of an effect she's having on Cora, you know, as a character. That's uh, very fascinating. And just to go back to the first episode briefly, I mean, especially in the first episode and even in the last one for that matter, there is quite a bit of uh, brutality and, and violence. There are whippings, there are there's a burning and much more, but this is obviously not what the story is ultimately about. However, how did you decide when to linger or to stay on a shot, when to cut to reaction shots of which we get quite a few and when to cut away completely? Yeah, you know, there's like Barry wanted the violence. He spoke to me and also James Laxon, our cinematographer. He spoke to us about how he wanted to approach the violence. And he wanted it, you know, there, you can't really tell the story of slavery in America without having some, you know, semblance of violence. But we didn't want that to be the main focus of what this series is about. We touch upon it, but we touch upon it in a way where it's present, it's very visceral. Um, but I think one of the things that Barry talks about is you know, showing imagery in a way that is impactful, but not overly grotesque. So one of that first times when you see Chester and Cora being whipped, we approach it in a very wide shot. We're not cutting to a tight shot of, you know, the whip hitting flesh. It's a very wide shot. And then uh, ever so eloquently, we pan over and then we get the reaction of Caesar and the rest of, you know, the, the group having to, to witness that. And that's one of the things that we constantly do with the, um, with, you know, the violence is the action and then the bearing witness of how that violence is impacting other people. Um, and so that's what we, it was, a, it was a delicate balance of knowing when to be on the violence and when to be on the actual reactions. And that's what we really worked on to, so as an audience, you, you're taking it in, but it never ever feels like it's too much, hopefully. Right, yeah, absolutely. And you already mentioned James Laxton. Um, I think the editing, the sound, the score and the cinematography really in particular all beautifully work in concert uh, with one another on this show. 
Could you shed some light on what your collaboration with James, uh, with whom you also went to college, uh, Nicholas Bertel, the composer, and the sound department looked like? So the entire collaboration and how that process worked? Yeah, you know, the thing that I love about working with Barry Jenkins is that he always empowers you to do your best. And there's no, like, there's always an overlap between departments. So we're always talking with each one another. We're always communicating. You know, James called me while they're on production and he would check in with me and be like, am I not getting anything that you need? And I was like, no, you're doing a great job. Um, Cause you know, Barry's not a huge fan of inserts. So James and him have come up with a way with getting important elements, you know, as you know, like for instance, chorus seeds were a very strong through line throughout the series. And they would find ways of incorporating her with the seeds in a way that it felt authentic and not like, we're going punching in for an insert here. Um, and then with the sound and the music department, it's, you know, Nicholas Bertel and Amelie Blank are just such, I would say like, they're just so, so intuitive and always ready for the challenge, you know? Cause we'll always be like, can we do this? And they're like, yes, we can. <laughs> But not only are they talking to Barry and I, but they're also talking to one another. You know, one of the things that, one of the sections of chapter one that I really love is the introduction of Ridgeway. Mm -hmm. um, and what that sounds like, you know, sonically, and they, they worked in concert with the sound design and also the score. Um, so, you know, Nick talked to Anna and was like, oh, if you're gonna be in that key, then I'll bring my score in around here. And I think that's why everything works so cohesively together is because we're always communicating with one another and how can we enhance, um, you know, what's already on the screen. And in that regard, I have always been interested in this, uh, in I guess the chronology of this collaboration, of this process, do you already have a rough cut of an episode that the sound department and the composer can then use as a basis for their work or how does that process work in that um, chronology? Yeah, so we, um, so Barry, James and I all had the same sound professor, Richard Portman, who was an amazing um, uh, sound mixer in his own right. And um, he, he, unfortunately he's passed, but he really taught us that, you know, film is 50% picture, 50% sound. And so as I'm working on my edit, I'm also laying out like a little bit of a blueprint for Anna Lee of what the soundscape is, you know, what we're going for. And you know, the, what I have and what she has, you know, like <laughs> she has recordings for days. So it's kind of like, you know, we would like this to sound like this. And then, you know, she comes back with these epic sounds of, you know, like 50,000 trains and horns. <laughs> Wow. Um, but yeah, so we kind of like, because Barry also, when he's watching something back, he also is, you know, listening. And so I know like, oh, you know, I'm going to try a little something with like, for instance, the dream that Ridgeway has in um, Indiana winter. Um, it was one of those things where one of my tracks got out of sync. So the train was playing one frame off. Mm -hmm. And Barry's like, what did you do with that sound design? I'm like, oh, you know what? It's actually off by a frame. So one track's playing a little earlier than the other. He's like, I love it. Wow. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So he's always listening and always reimagining things. And that's one of the things that, you know, I think it keeps us on our toes, but also, you know, makes the experience that much more, you know, ecstatic when you're always challenging what you can do. Absolutely. And each episode of this uh, show is completely different from uh, all the others, yet at the core of all of them is Cora's journey, her journey out of slavery and her journey toward her possession of personhood. How do you manage to, I guess, stay loyal to this overarching journey that Cora goes on over the course of these 10 episodes, especially in episodes in which Cora isn't necessarily the main or only focus? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where um, when you're paying it, like when you're watching the series, you know, it, as individual episodes, you're like, oh, we achieved it here. But then when you're watching it as a whole, you have to always check in with Cora. And one of the things that we did in um, Tennessee Proverbs is um, initially that opening, the way the episode happens, it didn't really exist. You know, it started with them just going back to Ridgeway's house. And, um, you know, we came up with this dream sequence and, um, I think placing that in the beginning made you enter that episode through Cora. 
in that, you know, put an emphasis on her. So even though throughout that episode, you're peeling back layers of Ridgeway and what happened to, you know, his family once he left, you're still grounded in her point of view. And that's one of the things that we, uh, you know, overall, we would check in and make sure that, you know, Cora is not like her, either her perspective is represented or, you know, we're, we're throwing in something where you remember, oh yeah, this is Cora's story. Even though this person may be taking over for a little bit, we're still grounded in her character. And throughout the series, uh, there are these very specific shots of characters staring directly at the camera, sometimes alone, uh, other times uh, in a group. How did you decide when exactly to include and cut to these portrait-like shots of characters? It's one of those things where I, you know, Barry and I always say the film will tell you what it wants to be. <laughs> wow. So, you know, some, you know, oftentimes you'll hold on to the scene because it's really cool. And then the film will kind of reject it because when you watch it as a whole, you're like, this doesn't work. Um, and then the same, like, and so I mentioned that to say that's how those portraits are. They kind of speak to you and tell you where they want to be placed. Um, and so I remember when we were first receiving that one of our assistant editors, um, Matt Willard was like, what are we supposed to be doing with these shots? Like they don't have scene numbers. And I was like, oh, we're going to find a place for them. <laughs> and that's, and that's really how it went was, you know, we, you know, I remember working on Indiana winter um, when we were doing that bait debate between um, John Valentine and Mingo. And as we were getting that scene, like to the place where it felt almost like pretty much polished, it was Ben Barry was like, okay, now let's try to weave in some of these portraits. So when Mingo talks about his family, you know, we put in an image of his family. Um, and then especially for the end when, um, when Cora's finally having her, you know, her showdown with Ridgeway, pulling in some of those portraits to really emphasize that moment was something that we went back to. And, you know, we really wanted to pick moments that emphasize who she's carrying with her as she walks back over to Ridgeway. Um, and that was one of those things that we did. We never ever want to overuse anything. We never ever want anything to feel like a gimmick. And so one of the things that we really wanted to say is like when we're using these shots, there's a there's a definitive intent and purpose behind them. They're not just for show. And you already mentioned episode nine, uh, Indiana Winter, which is uh, quite the big deal because there are moments of love and connection between Cora and Royal. There's of course the horrific massacre in which we see everything the Valentine community has built get destroyed. And then Cora has her big moment uh, opposite Ridgeway. These are a lot of developments and a lot of themes to juggle. How did you do it? Well, that episode, I, I will say, I am probably the most proud of that episode because it could have been, you know, it, like they say, it could have been the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's um, true. Because that, yeah. that was, um, that was the one that I think Barry saw, saw my face and was like, you got to join, <laughs> you can do it, Joy. Um, just because, you know, working on the show during the pandemic and, oh, yeah. Um, not really having those moments of escapism where you can go and meet up with a friend for a drink or grab dinner. You're just either in the edit or at home, you know, and it, and at times it can become a bit overwhelming. Um, but there was a necessity to tell this story and to tell it in this way. And that's why Indiana Winter was so important to get right. Um, you know, it, it just, it represents so much of our American history and um, so much of the injustices that we face, you know, throughout this country. And it also is one of those things where, you know, the presentation of that first half of that episode is one of my favorites. I just, yeah. I love the what could have been and the hope um, of these people. And it's just one of the things where, you know, Barry is, he just, he loves to create these worlds that are just so dynamic and fully realized. And um, I know it's devastating at the end, but you know, sometimes you can just watch that first half of that episode. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, I, it was, it was, it was tough to get through, but you know, we definitely got through it together. Um, and it was one of those things where sometimes Barry would pop in and, and we would go and, and we knew exactly what scene we had to start with and we knew exactly what we needed to chip away at. But it was one of those things that at the end of the day, it, it just came 
it came to not only full like realization, but it blossomed into something that was so beautiful of an episode. And um, I'm so glad that I dug deep and found the strength to get through it because it was one of those things where at the end of the day, I'm still blown away that we were able to create something like that. It's an absolutely uh, brilliant episode. Thank you. And uh, on a final note, uh, you worked uh, on the upcoming feature film uh, Zola, <laughs> which premiered at Sundance last year and is being released in US theaters on June 30th. And yeah. you will also be working on Barry Jenkins' next project, uh, which is the untitled Lion King prequel, which is very exciting. What can you tease us about these two upcoming projects, if anything? Um, a lot different than Undergrad. <laughs> Um, you know, I will say to start with Zola. Zola is one of those um, films that I feel like in in the wrong hands, it could have been um, so different and and told in a way that was so cliche. Um, and I'll just say that Janixa Bravo is is truly a genius. I think she honored not only the storyteller, but you know, she honored the vision of cinema. And I'm excited for people to, you know, finally get to experience Zola um, and go on the roller coaster of a ride that it is. Um, there are ups and downs, but at the end of the day, I think it takes, you know, it takes a village to create something um, so personal, but also a lot of fun. And, you know, Jeremy O'Harris, Coleman Domingo, Riley Kilo, Taylor Page, Nicholas Braun, um, T.S. Madison, everyone brought their A game. And it was definitely, you know, it was quite an experience. I had such a good time working on it. Um, and I'm excited for people to go on this journey um, on June 30th. And um, if, if you had told me two years ago, Barry and I would be working on a Lion King movie, I don't know if I would have believed you. Um, but after this journey of going on the Underground Railroad, I, you know, it definitely made me realize as a filmmaker, like, what else do you have? You know, I feel like we can do it all now. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that we're, we're embarking on an animated movie, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. Um, and, you know, whether it's a, you know, live action or an animated film, uh, Barry demands authenticity. And so I think the, the story that we're getting ready to tell is one um, that is, you know, might be familiar, but I also feel like it is, um, it is a journey of self-discovery and I'm excited to, you know, there's so many different elements that we get to play with and um, a whole new set of tools that we have access to. So I'm really excited for people to see um, what we come up with. Well, we're certainly excited. And uh, thank you much. Thank you so much, George, for joining us today. And to our viewers, make sure to check out the Underground Railroad on Amazon Prime Video if you haven't already. And make sure to click subscribe before you leave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.